Okay, so in the previous lecture we were talking about approximate dynamic programming or at least we introduced the idea of approximate dynamic programming which was uh, when you have a general nonlinear state transition function, general cost function, high dimensional or perhaps a low dimensional state space or action space, how do you actually do dynamic programming on embedded devices? It's, it's one of the one of the major issues in today's world and a lot of companies and a lot of uh, people are working on this topic from different domains. It, you could look at building management system, you could look at sewage management system, you can look at medical devices or you can look at uh, autonomous vehicles. This is one of the major issues. How do you run dynamic programming on, on embedded systems or embedded controllers in real time? And so approximate dynamic programming techniques are very, very useful there. <clears throat> so in the previous lecture, I have mentioned about four ways by which you typically come up with approximate dynamic programming algorithm. The first one was model approximation. And I haven't spent much time talking about model approximation, but I will do, do it in the next class. Um, I talked about value function and policy function approximation. Um, and we talked about the function approximating classes. And we saw several examples of function approximating classes. There are many, many examples of function approximating classes. And some of the uh, references you want to check out would be in the non-parametric regression. Uh, like any book that has non-parametric regression or parametric regression or neural network or reproducing kernel Hilbert space, these are all the books that would just talk about function approximating classes for various types of uh, uh, problems. And you can just pull all the theory or all the function classes that are there in, in those books into the approximate dynamic programming framework. So, uh, so there's no, what I would say is that in order to come up with function approximating class, you don't really have to spend too much time worrying about it. Just look at the uh, regression topics, topics in regression, and pull the function approximating class for whatever problem you are studying. Now, <coughs> the fourth problem, uh, the fourth way to approximate the model, uh, fourth way to approximate the dynamic programming was how do you deal with long horizon length? So, that's what we are going to talk about. Or I, ADP with long horizon length. So my T, capital T, is let's say 10,000. And I have to run a dynamic program on an embedded system. And how do, I, how do I do it? So in order to uh, try to conceptualize what exactly uh, we need to do, let's, uh, let me introduce two operators. So the first operator is Bellman operator, which takes a value function and outputs another value function. So I'm going to define it as B of V of X dt. Let me say Bt plus one, no, uh, Bt of Vt plus one. Let me write Bt plus 1, Vt plus 1, Xt is min over u in, u in ut, or ut in ut, c of Xt ut plus Vt plus 1, Ft Xt ut, such that gt of xt ut less than equal to 0 
Okay, so this is a Bellman, this is known as a Bellman operator. I'm going to introduce another one which is policy operator. Which takes as input a value function and outputs a policy. So P argument of the same equation above. Okay, so now what exactly are we doing in the value iteration, not the value iteration, what exactly are we doing when we are doing the backward uh, dynamic programming? So we compute V of capital T as B capital T plus one, C capital T plus one, and then V of T minus one, is b of b of t b of t plus 1 c of t plus 1 and so on so i can write v of t as b of t plus 1 b of t plus 2 b of Okay, so this is what we are doing. We are iteratively applying the Bellman operator to update and derive the value function at every point of time. This is the exact dynamic programming algorithm. Any questions on this part? Is it clear how we are iteratively applying the Bellman operator in order to derive the value function? Okay. <clears throat> in particular, I can say that at any point of time, based on this idea, I can say at any point of time, my v of t is b of t plus 1, b of t plus 2, b of t plus n, capital N, of v of t plus capital N. Okay, so I want to run a dynamic programming with only, I have an embedded hardware and that hardware can run a dynamic programming of at most capital N steps, okay? So if you have a small microcontroller and it can run the dynamic programming for two step DP, then this capital N is equal to two. If you have a very complicated GPU uh, on an autonomous vehicle and it can run the dynamic programming equation for uh, 20 time steps, then this capital N is equal to 20. <clears throat> okay. What about the policy? Well, gamma star T is P of T plus 1, 
by the way i have written a policy operator but the, but in books there is nothing known as a policy operator there is only bellman operator so i'm using the policy operator purely for this class don't go around uh, searching the internet on policy operator because nothing like that exists uh, in mathematical literature So here is the problem. In order to compute v, Vt plus n, you have to run this dynamic programming recursion starting from this time step and you go all the way back until you get to Vt plus n. Now, I as a, when you are executing the policy, you are starting at time t equals to zero and the whole problem is that I, my capital T is very large. So if I have to start all the way from back in order to compute Vt plus n, and then go all the way back to compute Vt all the way to V0 and gamma star 0 or gamma star 1, it's going to take a humongous amount of time. And I won't be able to. Uh, run the system according to the optimal policy. So what would you do in that situation? Knowing that when you're starting at time zero, V zero or gamma star zero, you don't have this particular value function that is needed. You don't have V capital N, but you still have to take some action, right? Uh, so you don't really know this. So let's, let's, let's think about it. So I'm at time t equals to 0. So at time t equals to 0, I need to compute gamma star 0 of x0. This is my current state. This is the policy that I want to compute. And it turns out that this is equal to P1 composition Pn of Vn. And I don't know Vn. I don't know because computing Vn is going to take a long time because my capital T is very, very large. So what would you do? Oh, actually, I probably screwed up. So this should be B, B, T plus 2, and then PT plus 1. So what should I do? I don't know what my Vn is, and I have to compute the policy at this moment. Any thoughts? Nothing is off the table. You can come up with any idea you want. Can you approximate the horizon length? Approximate the horizon length. So I have capital T equals to 10,000. What do you want to do by approximating the horizon length? Okay, so let me give you an example. N equals to 20, T equals to 10,000. We need to do something. 
I can only run 20 time step dynamic program in my embedded device, whatever embedded hardware I have. That's the maximum I can go. Okay, divide t into 20 intervals, and then what? So I don't have the state transition function for those, right? I have a state transition function that tells me what the state is going to be next time step, but nothing that tells me what the state is going to be 200 time steps later, or whatever, 500 time steps later. And remember that even within those 500 time steps, you still have to take an action at every point of time, which is, satisfies all the constraints. It's not a bad idea, by the way. It's a good idea, but you still have to do a little bit more work to do that. Then you are talking about model approximation, right? So you want to do a, actually that's a good idea. You want to do a model approximation, so your horizon length instead of being 10,000 long, your horizon length would be some manageable length, 30, 40, 50 time steps. And then you compute your VN by solving that optimization problem. No, you don't compute the VN, you compute an approximate VN by solving that optimization problem. And then you plug it in here for real time implementation. That's a good idea. I'm not sure if anyone has tried that before, so maybe you should be the first person to try it. I, I don't know, maybe somebody has tried it, I, I just don't know. But thinking out loud, I think that it's a very good idea. It should be tried. <clears throat> Anything much simpler than that? How about I take Vn to be equal to zero? So I just kill the function. I, I pick Vn to be a zero function. So at every point of time t, I compute approximate. So I'm going to use hat for approximation as Pt plus one, Bt plus two, Bt plus capital N zero. So I pick a zero function, my terminal cost, sorry, the terminal value function in the dynamic program is going to be zero. And then I compute my policy, okay? It's a heuristic, I'm not saying it's a good heuristic, but it's a heuristic, and in some applications it works. Now I want you to think in which application would this heuristic be pretty bad? So where, in which application is this going to fail? Why would this be a bad strategy in certain applications? What is, so the way to think about it is what information am I losing by changing the value Vn here to a zero function? What exactly am I losing? So if you think about it, Vn, the value function at time n, this encapsulates the terminal cost information, okay? 
And so if your terminal cost is a major cost, you have zero running cost, like is the case in neural networks, you have zero running cost, you only have a terminal cost, then Vn is supposed to encapsulate all the information about that terminal cost. And if you kill Vn, if you put a zero function here, and you come up with the optimal strategy, you're basically losing all information about the terminal cost. So let me give you an example. You want to send a rocket from Earth to Mars, and it's a very long horizon. How much, do you know how much time it takes to go from Earth to Mars? Probably like 500 days or something, like something like that, 400, 500 days. Okay, so T is, but, but the rocket has to act every second or every millisecond, you know? So you can think capital T is such a large number and you can't really run very long dynamic program on the rocket. And the goal for the rocket is to reach Mars, okay? And that's the terminal cost function. So the cost function CT of the rocket is going to be XT minus point on Mars square. The goal for the rocket is to reach certain point on Mars. That's the terminal cost function. And so if you replace, if you can only do 20 time step, which is the rocket can only do dynamic program for two seconds or three seconds, and you put a zero terminal value, what's the optimal strategy for the rocket? To not move, right? because you have lost all the information about this terminal cost when you changed this Vn to V0. Sorry, Vn to zero. So that's the situation where the majority, the bulk of the cost is terminal cost. For instance, playing games, the bulk of the cost, you win the game only at the end, okay? So bulk of the cost is actually, or bulk of the reward comes after winning the game, which is at the terminal time step. So, or when you want to get to a destination, the bulk of the cost or reward is at the terminal time step, not in the intermediate time step. So, in those situations, this kind of algorithm is pretty bad. Uh, but in situations where the terminal cost is, okay, whatever, I just have a running cost and I want to minimize the running cost. I don't really have, I don't really care about the terminal cost that much. Or if I aggregate the entire cost, then the terminal cost part is actually very small component of the overall cost. Then in that case, uh, this particular heuristic is actually a good heuristic. Okay, so it's a good heuristic. When running costs are high. Okay, any other question? Any question on this, this part? Okay, so you can do 20 step dynamic program and you take the terminal cost to be zero and then you run the DP, you get the policy for the current time step, you proceed further and then you redo the entire DP for BT plus N plus one zero all the way up to PT plus two, and then you get the optimal policy at time two, at time T plus one, and so on and so forth. You just keep running the dynamic program every time step, and <clears throat> that's how you proceed in this particular heuristic, approximate dynamic programming heuristic. Now the question is, okay, fine. When there is, uh, when the running costs are high, this seems to be a good heuristic. What happens when the running cost is not high? When you have, when you have to go to Mars, what do you do? 
what should you do when you have to go to Mars? I mean, people have gone to Mars, so they have done something, <laughs> something right, so that they reached Mars. But it seems to me that, that we cannot capture it here. What do you think? What would you do if you were the chief engineer or chief scientist for the Mars mission? How would you run dynamic programming on the rocket? We know something about the terminal cost, right? We know that it's high. Uh, right, yeah, you know, you know the terminal cost. You, you know everything, you know the entire problem formulation, you know the rocket. Uh, how the rocket moves, the state transition function of the rocket. And you have some running cost, maybe like the fuel consumption of the rocket or something, but the goal is to reach Mars. Doesn't matter how much fuel it consumes, that's the goal, right? So, so you can estimate the, the terminal cost? Sorry? Estimate the value of the terminal cost? Estimate the value of the terminal cost. So, you are saying that estimate Vn. Yeah. Okay, so his, his point is, we should estimate, say, V hat n. Oh, why just V hat n? I need to estimate V hat n plus 1, V hat p minus 1, and so on. Oh, but actually that's the problem we are trying to solve here. How do you? Well, no, actually our problem is different. We want to compute the policy at time zero. But in order to compute policy at time zero, I need to know Vn. First heuristic was I set the terminal Vn to be zero in the dynamic program. The second policy is the second uh, heuristic is I just estimate v hat n or v hat n plus 1 and so on. Any thoughts on how you would do that? Let me give you a hint. So, so you are the chief scientist and some person in your team knows a way to get to Mars. It, it knows a policy to get to Mars, get to that particular point in Mars. So it will come up with some, he thought about it for a long time and he has a good, he has a policy, it may not be optimal policy, it may not be a good policy, but he has a policy that will get you from Earth to Mars. Can we somehow incorporate that information in our dynamic program? The fact that at least one policy is feasible and will get us to our destination. Let's think about it. I mean, maybe that's a complicated problem. Let's think about it this way. So there's a target on High Street and you are sitting in Scott Lab and you want to go home and you know how to get to your home from, if you started from target at at, at High Street. But because you are starting at, from Scott Lab, you don't quite know how to get to your home. What would your, what, how would you solve this problem? You have so many people who are very knowledgeable in, about this area. You are a first, first year student in this department or in this university. What would you do? Ask for direction. To what? My home. <laughs> to your home directly? Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry? Ask for directions to Okay, yeah. So, so the, the idea is you want to ask for directions to the target at High Street because from there on you know how to get to your home. Okay? So this is how so let's try to see how that affects this particular uh, mathematical problem. So you know a policy to get from target to your home. 
and you want to construct a value function based on that information that you already have. So there is, let's assume that you have a heuristic, uh, a, a good policy. Well, I don't even want to say good policy, it's just a policy, feasible policy. Mu1, mu2, mu capital T. It's not an optimal policy, it's just a feasible policy. You can define V of T of X of T. Oh, I V hat, this is an approximation. So you can define V hat T of X of T as summation CS xs mu s xs plus ct plus 1 xt plus 1 s goes from t to capital t So given that I know a policy, I know a policy to get to Mars or I know a policy to get to my home from target, I'm going to construct my value function in this particular manner based on the policy that I already know. And then I'm going to substitute, so I have to compute this v hat t for all time t, okay, and I have to store it in the memory. So it requires a bit more memory. It requires a bit more me uh, memory on the embedded device. But assuming you have a lot of memory, you can um, you can compute this v hat for every time t, and instead of v n here, you can substitute v hat n there. So your gamma t star no, I should say hat of x t would be. I shouldn't put star here. These are all approximate policies. Pt plus 1, Bt plus 2, Bt plus n, v hat, t plus n. And this algorithm is known as rollout algorithm. This part is like asking for directions to get to target, and then from target, you of course know how to get to your home optimally. Okay? So the rollout algorithm is actually a pretty sophisticated algorithm. No, actually uh, I shouldn't say sophisticated. You might, you might see it and you might think it looks fairly simple algorithm, but it's actually a very, very um, useful heuristic for approximate dynamic programming. So the whole field of reinforcement learning is based on this particular idea, okay, of this rollout idea. And you might have heard about these computers that play chess and computers that play the game of Go and many other games. And it was in press for quite some time in the past few years. All of those training algorithms for playing those games are actually based on this simple idea of rollout algorithm, okay? Now in those games, they iteratively update the feasible policy uh, after every few iterations. So they, they start with a feasible policy or they start with a very bad policy. 
and then the game and then they do the the then they apply the rollout algorithm and then they figure out what the optimal policy is then they replace it with the feasible policy here okay so this gamma hat t becomes the new mu1 mu2 mu3 all the way up to mu capital t and then they do the rollout again and then you get a new set of gamma hat t that becomes the feasible policy for the next iteration and so on and so forth so they keep doing it again and again and after a few days or few months of training these algorithms become sophisticated enough that they can play against a human being and defeat them in the game of chess or in the game of go okay so rollout algorithm is actually very very powerful any question on the rollout algorithm <clears throat> okay so in some sense this rollout algorithm is able to take into account the running cost as well as the terminal cost and and if you want to go to mars you can definitely apply rollout algorithm to get to the Mar get to mars optimally approximately optimally these are all approximate dynamic programming schemes not the true dynamic programming schemes one property of the rollout algorithm is that this policy gamma hat t gives you a strictly better cost or strictly lower cost than this well i shouldn't say strictly lower but it gives you a lower cost or equal to cost with respect to the policy mu1 to mu t so let's say you wanted to get to mars and you will consume 1000 tons of fuel to get to mars <coughs> under the feasible policy using the optimal policy based on this rollout idea you will probably consume 950 tons of fuel so you will strictly reduce the amount of fuel that is needed to get to mars based on this rollout idea the key thing of course is you want this end to be as large as possible so as to make sure that you are along the optimal trajectory or close to the optimal trajectory um, but you know this end is typically bounded by the embedded hardware you have on board the vehicle or on board the rocket or whatever system you are trying to use and this rollout algorithm is also used in the supply chain optimization so how many milk should kroger buy and stock on their shelves over the next one week um so they they use some form of rollout algorithm to figure out you know all these supply chain uh problems we of course in electrical engineering we don't study it but industrial engineering people worry a lot about it and so they frequently employ rollout algorithm for optimizing a whole bunch of operational things like how many stuff kroger should buy how should airline manage their fleet of aircrafts and how should the uh, aircraft personals be managed and so on and so forth so all of those type of problems could be solved using rollout algorithm any question on this okay now the third policy the the third thing that i'm going to talk about is uh, model predictive control now model predictive control is a very very large field so i'm going to just use a prototypical problem not a very uh <coughs> uh like a very small part of or very simple part of model predictive control but there are more sophisticated algorithms than what i'm going to present in the class on this particular topic so the idea here is you want to stay you want your state to be close to zero you want your state to follow some trajectory and so your state would be you know your own gps coordinate and the trajectory that you want to follow so the difference between the two and you want that difference to be as small as possible so so what do you do well 
And, and, and this is the problem. So your T is, capital T is very large, and your capital N is only 20. So, so how do you deal with that situation? So in this particular case, you expect Let me make sure I'm. You, your cost function, CT of XT, UT, and of course, your XT plus 1 is a usual nonlinear. Uh, state transition function. And you know, you assume a feasible policy mu1 to mu capital T is known. Let me call it, well, no, let, let me keep it mu1 to mu t. So it meets all the constraints. Uh, remember, we had a bunch of equality and inequality constraints. So it meets all those constraints. And it is known such that x t, x t plus n So this feasible policy is going to change at every time t. So how should I write it? OK. I, 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 want, to, I want to rewrite this sentence, and I'm trying to think about how to rewrite it better. So basically, at every point of time t, you are looking at the n horizon problem, and you want to have a feasible policy for that n horizon problem such that the terminal state is equal to 0. That's what I want to write. So this is the cost. This is the state transition function uh, at time t. A feasible policy mu t mu t plus n is known such that okay this is better x t plus n is equal to zero. Yes. Are Q and R positive definite? Uh, Q and R are pos positive semi-definite and positive definite. This is known as constrained controllability condition. So assume that the constraint con controllability condition holds, then you solve the following problem. I want to minimize summation of Cs xs us s equals to t to t plus n such that gs less than equal to 0 
h s equal to 0 and <coughs> x t plus n is equal to 0. <coughs> Maybe I should make it n minus 1. Minimum over gamma hat. So what's the new thing we did here? <coughs> what's the terminal cost here? Let me just write the terminal cost explicitly. It's zero. So I, I, I did not add the terminal cost. I'm actually doing what I had written on the board on the other side, but there is a small twist to this new optimization problem, which is instead of adding a terminal cost, I added a constraint, a new equality constraint at the terminal time step, and that equality constraint is xt plus n is equal to zero. This is in addition to xt plus n equals to zero constraint. Okay, And the reason why I want to put this constraint is because I want my state to, close, to be close to zero. I want my xt to be close to zero. xt here is an error between your current trajectory and your desired trajectory. So you want your xt plus n to be zero. Uh, sorry, you want your xt to be very small. Uh, so what you do is you put a terminal constraint that xt plus n is equal to zero instead of adding a value function here. And this is known as the model predictive control algorithm. This assumption is not used in the formulation of the optimization problem, but why this assumption is important is to know that there is a feasible policy that allows us to get there. So then you can optimize over it. If you don't know there is a feasible policy, if there is no feasible policy, this algorithm is not going to stop. It's just keep going to, it will keep finding, trying to find a feasible policy and it will never be able to find a feasible policy because none exist. So this assumption is purely to, is purely needed to require, is purely needed to make sure that this particular algorithm will run and terminate. Otherwise it's not going to terminate. Okay, if this assumption fails, this algorithm may not terminate. So that's why we have to make that assumption. And then once that assumption is made, this algorithm will terminate and you will be able to compute an optimal solution. Any question on this problem? Now let me ask you a question. I, I want to make sure, yeah, I have like a few minutes, a couple of minutes. Let me ask you a question. If instead I wanted to add a terminal cost, I don't want this uh, equality constraint, I want to add a terminal cost, what would I do? What is this equivalent to? <laughs> this optimization problem, what is this equivalent to? If I don't, if I want to, I want to keep these constraints because these are from the original problem, but this is sort of a new constraint that I've added. Now I want to remove this constraint and I want to put something in the cost function. What should I do? We can do Lagrange relaxation, right? So we can do Lagrange relaxation and I can write it as lambda star T plus N transpose x t plus n. Of course, I don't know what this lambda star is because that's what I'm trying to solve. So I don't know what this lambda star t plus n is. But ideally, I want to put a lambda star t plus n here, transpose x t plus n. This lambda star t plus n is likely going to depend on x t plus n minus 1. So let me write it explicitly. So this 
lambda star, which is the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to this constraint, depends on xt plus n minus 1 transpose xt plus n. So then you can erase this constraint. If you knew this, this uh, function, this Lagrange multiplier, you could erase this constraint and just put this as the terminal cost. Then this becomes the terminal cost v hat t plus n xt plus n. But because you don't know this Lagrange multiplier, you basically put that in the constraint and, 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 and it, it's fine. You, you get the same solution. You essentially get the same solution under both situations. So this is just something to keep in mind that sometimes when you have a cost, you can move it into constraint and sometimes when you have a constraint, you can move it into cost. <coughs> the only problem is you need to have some idea of what the Lagrange multiplier is going to look like. Okay, so in this class, what we talked about was how do you do approximate dynamic programming where the horizon length is pretty long and the computational uh, capability on board is pretty limited. N equals to 20, capital T equals to 10,000. So this is, these are the three sort of broad topics, broad uh, algorithms or heuristics for approximate dynamic programming. There are several papers written, papers and books written on model predictive control. So I encourage you to look into it if, if this is what your research involves. And uh, in the next class, we are going to talk about model approximation and uh, we'll see some ways of approximating the model and, and how do you solve problems with model approximation. So thank you. See you on Friday. <coughs>